Right. I am recording live with Jade Sabansky, and today we're going to explore the idea of if friends are real, do friends really exist <laughs> anymore? And if so, how do we make them more real? So, uh, Jade, how are you doing this uh, 2021? Hey, Isaac, I'm doing great today. Thanks for having me. Good. So um, this is actually a topic that in some way or another over especially the last year, I've had a couple people or at least, I don't know, a handful of people or so say, hey, what about this topic? Because um, it, it's getting harder and harder to maintain real friendships, I think partly with the internet age and then even more so in the pandemic age, uh, especially as the world is kind of falling apart and our personas kind of fall off and uh, we can get a little uh, harder to deal with and, and so on and so on. And so we were discussing possibly a topic like this. And what I kind of wanted to do as like a side project is over the next, I don't know, couple years or so, see if I can do a podcast like this on each of the now 24 rules of for life by Jordan B. Peterson. Uh, so this time we're actually going to go back to the first book, rule number three. And what's that rule, Jade? Make friends with people who want the best for you. Right. And so that's, that's really, that's really critical because Sometimes that sounds like a no brainer, like, oh yeah, of course we're gonna do that. We're gonna make friends with people who want the best for us. But especially as he gets into it in this chapter, we realize that it's actually really easy to make friends with people who don't want the best for us. And he in the, in the chapter, I don't know how much we'll get into the details of the chapter, just because there's a lot to cover and there's some other you know videos and podcasts that go into more of those details. But there's a lot of reasons that we get into self-destructive kind of friendships, whether that's a self-sabotaging type behavior or it's just the easier thing to do or whatever else. But um, Jade, what are your initial thoughts and, and things on this chapter and this idea? Well, I, reached, I originally reached out to you, Isaac, because there's this question looming in the back of my mind for years now of, can we actually help our friends? How much can we actually do for our friends? Because I'm coming from a place where I felt that I tried my hardest and I gave my all and still ended up walking away on multiple instances. So not just with one first, not just with one person or, or, or one off. And I grew up believing that we could help everyone or I grew up believing in altruism and I grew up believing that we should try and help people. But then it got to the point where I realized that there is a line between helping your friend and then just enabling toxic behavior or ultimately putting yourself in a situation where you're getting harmed. Mm -hmm. And it was one of those moments where Jordan Peterson talks about where you experience betrayal and then you, you're doubting everything else that, mm. that is in life when he talks. And I think he used the instance of getting broken up with or getting cheated on most often. Do you know what I'm talking about on a lot of his podcasts? And then mm. because of one, one thing happens, you're left questioning a lot of other things. Yeah, and, well, in particular, just experiencing malevolence and or uh, betrayal. And it's especially because we kind of come into this world as young adults you know like all bright-eyed and bushy-tailed for the most part like under the illusion that or, or naive belief or foolish belief which is actually good because if we didn't have our own uh foolishness and naive is it naivete or, or whatever then we'd probably be overly conservative so to speak and and not enter into a lot of relationships that we should probably at least try out uh, but mm -hmm. then at some point, probably in our mid twenties, which is uh, where you're at in life, uh, yep. you, you, that, those illusions start to fall, fall off and fall apart. And then you start to have to deal with that reality. And then as we deal with that reality, on one hand, you want to be like, um, 
what 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 do we do now? Do we give up on people? Do we give up on friendships? Do we become more um, perpetuating? And 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 once once you experience that behavior and that betrayal or that malevolence, it's like you you the temptation is to either perpetuate it by saying that's okay, so to speak, or um, it's it's really tricky because on the other hand, um, and, the, and that chapter talks a lot about, you know, distancing yourself from them or cutting them off or just not being friends with them anymore, which is really tricky, mm-hmm. especially, like I said, in 2021, when a lot of people are exhibiting this kind of behavior and it might not be the normal them. It might just be everybody's under a lot of stress these days. Um, so yeah, now it's like everybody's kind of showing, you know, our, our personas aren't holding up like they probably should. So it's putting a lot of people in a, in a, t- in a, in tough spots where, you know, what, what do we do about that? How do we, uh, discern when to maintain the relationship and when not to, um, and, I guess the other thing that, because that that chapter talked a lot about sort of like the negative side, which is, you know, how what how we end up in bad relationships and what to do about it, which for the most part is to just not have them. Um, but especially in times like we're experiencing now, we need to know when to like have mercy, give people other chances, and so on. Yeah. But that can be a slippery slope too. So um, I don't know, what has been your experience or your thought on, on that? It can absolutely be really hard mm. to tell when to walk away or when to double down, yeah. so to speak, and yeah. put in more, put it, put in the work and put in more effort. Right. And I was recently listening to something by Case Kenny, who's an author in Chicago. And mm. he actually has two questions to ask yourself mm. before you walk away from a relationship. And it's interesting because I was listening to it with a specific person in mind. And now I realize how applicable it was to the, the friends that I had to say bye to. So the first question is, have you put in your all? And with the case of uh, the friendships that brought me to this conversation today, I 110% put in my all 100% Mm. absolutely gave them everything I could was there with them on the phone or in person, heard them out, sent resources, listened, was patient, took into consideration the life stressors that were happening just with the pandemic, but also in their, in, in both of their personal lives. Mm. And I took all of that and, and, and it was to the point where I was even making breaks for making excuses for them when I maybe shouldn't have. Mm-hmm. And the second question is, are you clear about what you want? And that's really interesting because yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Because if I wasn't getting what I wanted, which was a healthy, stable, low maintenance friendship mm-hmm. that was dependable and non-toxic then, and I, and I never came out and said it that directly, but I was like, Hey, this is messed up. You can't treat me like this. Or, um, this isn't really how people who love each other speak to each other. Right. But I think that with those two questions, it does make me feel better and and more confident in my decision to end the friendships. Mm -hmm. So it's super interesting to think about it like that. Yeah. And I'll bring up, uh, uh, when Jordan Peterson talks about this and he mentioned this in this chapter and some other videos on the topic. Um, and also I put up a paragraph from Robert Greene that said almost the same exact thing, uh, quoting Nietzsche, but there's this thing and I, I can't pronounce the German, right? I'd have to, like, <laughs> oh. but it's like Schadenfreuden versus Mitfreuden. But uh, Schadenfreuden is basically the, uh, the natural impulse to envy and be, and envy is usually more so your relationships, especially close relationships. And so it's a natural sort of um, lower animal instinct, so to speak, the snake, as Nietzsche put it. Uh, and I'll, I'll put that, maybe I'll pull it up in a minute or, or just uh, put it in the notes or whatever. But we have this instinct to envy and this instinct, it's like our lower animal sort of nature. And that, but then we, on the other hand, the mitfraden, as Nietzsche termed it, 
which is to share joy with. Um, so mm -hmm. to put that in sort of like this, some questions that, uh, or tests that Jordan Peterson uh, put forth for like, if it's a good friendship to have or not. Uh, the main one or, or two is, if you is what how do your friends respond when you share news so if you share good news do they help celebrate uh because some friends if you share good news they'll be like well i did something better you know mm -hmm. uh or like i know somebody did something better and and that happens sometimes mm -hmm. or uh maybe they won't exactly say that so advertly at least at first but they will yeah. uh you you can tell or, of course, they're, they're get the, you get the the cautious of the oh that's wonderful but you do know it could all fall apart right yeah yeah yeah. Like, undercut it right away yeah they they yeah they just they don't want to share in the joy but they're more uh envious um mm. so yeah you how do they respond when you share good news but then also how do they respond when you share bad news and generally um, and, you know, sometimes there's a whole like, oh, do they want to fix the problem or uh, and that's not exactly the thing. I mean, it's probably the best thing is if they'll just listen when you have bad news. But uh, the main thing is that you can tell they're not happy that you something bad happened. Mm. So be, and the other sort of example that he gives even in that chapter is. Um, you know, you might be trying to quit smoking or drink less or, um, you know, it's fine if you smoke weed sometimes, but sometimes you want to do so less. And but a lot of the friends around you, because they don't want you to um, be better than them. And they know if you, you know, shed off your bad habits and picked up good habits, then it would make them look bad in comparison. So they'll be like, here, just have a cigarette, you know, here, just have a drink when you're trying to, you know, turn over into sobriety or whatever. So uh, that's a big test right there. And I don't know, what do you think about that? Or what's your experience with that? Yeah, it reminds me of, it gets passed around in TV shows and movies a lot. I forget who said it first, but never forget that they want to see you doing good, but never better than them. Right, right, right. Yeah. And then it's in the, one of Drake's songs. He says, it's, I guess things change. It's funny how somebody else's success means pain. Yeah. And oftentimes too, and I just want to point out that mm. I don't, I don't know how it's been in your experience, but 90% mm. of the time with the people that I've known, it's been either subconscious or unconscious. And mm. These people weren't ex weren't exactly aware of what they were doing until after the fact. Right. And and, and I say ninety percent because in some cases I have had people be like, uh, I remember getting ready for a party once, and this was in college. This was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And I came out of the bathroom, and the girl I was going out with said, "You're making me look like shit right now." Yeah. And I was like, <laughs> "Whoa." Sounds like something that type of girl would say. Right. And then shor shortly after we were no longer friends, but yeah, most of the time, most of the time it is something that people aren't exactly aware of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I think in the chapter, he gives the example of Cain and Abel, who he talks a lot about. Uh, he just mentions in the chapter, but so the big thing with Cain and Abel in the Bible story, I think it's Genesis four or whatever, is that, uh, Abel had more favor with God. And so eventually Cain killed Abel and that led to uh, the, the whole, a whole other story that we won't get into, but basically out of jealousy. Um, another story that comes to mind is um, uh, Pinocchio, who Jordan Peterson mentions a lot. You know, he had these friends when he was like, uh, you know, naive in the world. I think Lampwick was one and he's like, ah, oh, come on, let's go to pleasure Island. And then that just turns him into mm -hmm. as uh, Jordan Peterson will often say is like a, a brain jackass, which is kind of what happens if you just go with the flow of everybody that just wants to have the pleasure of now, then you just kind of become a part of that 
uh, mass rather than him trying to become enlightened, which is to, you know, be a real boy without the puppet strings. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, th there's a lot of examples in the Bible and in mythology. And um, the, the other one, too, that he mentioned, well, he, he didn't mention the story of David, but he mentioned the, the statue of David, which actually that's, I, I didn't, I didn't get that at first. And that's like the, um, uh, um, the, the image he's talking the, about. Yeah. When he's well, talking about how, what could be, but isn't right. Right. That, that statue, that artwork, it's like screams out that you could be better than that you are. And it's, it's funny because actually that story, this, there's so much history and story in that statue, like maybe more than any other piece of art. But one was that uh, uh, Leonardo da Vinci was actually a more older and accomplished artist at that time. And he was on like the, some council of whatever, uh, Italian art at that time. And the, when the when it was all already finally or when it was finally finished, Leonardo really tried to lobby to like relegate the statue in like some off back corner of nowhere where nobody would see it. <laughs> and he like made he like drew out images of like look it should be like this. He exaggerated this and this too much. And uh, so basically, Leonardo da Vinci, which, which the the reason that that's interesting is because. You know, you would think that a person should try to, you know, be around and be influenced by and want to do what, uh, you know, people that you would look up to would want to do. So you'd think like, oh, it should be all about whatever Leonardo da Vinci wants to do because he was the more accomplished art artist at the time. Um, so that that's the other tricky thing is sometimes people that you maybe want to affiliate with will sometimes sabotage and backstab you out of jealousy too uh you know so so, so so on one hand there's the like finding people that have your values so like mm -hmm. avoiding people like lampwick for example <laughs> but then there, so and maybe that's try to be with somebody like leonardo da vinci and and that example but if they have that envy thing going on like cain and abel uh then they can try to kill you they can try to destroy your art or ruin it in a lot of different ways so that's how this gets a little extra complicated is you we want to find the, the people with the right values and the right kind of like goals that you're on but that envy thing is a really uh big thing to to watch out for but um what do you think what's your ideas and experience on on that stuff my whole heart as you were saying that I was mm. like no it's not <laughs> true people are good and, yeah. and uh, my head is like uh, mm. what about that experience you just had and the one before that and that mm. and that so it, it's a balance right but unfortunately it is one of those it's, it's just a reality that that's sometimes mm. going to happen because right. it's just human nature we're not right. wired to be bffs we're wired for survival mm. and there is that very primal um primal fear and scarcity mindset right. that hasn't quite been refreshed or updated in mm -hmm. everyone yet where it's like they feel like if somebody has something then that somehow takes away from you when that's not actually true though mm -hmm. so I, I do think that in the next 50 to 200 years we are going to shift more into that if uh, um the idea that a candle loses nothing by lighting another flame i think we will shift more into that but I don't think we're there yet at all. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and mm. it, I'm, I'm hopeful though, because I mean, even just today, I connected with somebody mm. in Boston virtually that mm. I felt like there was a lot of overlap and potential right. for friendship there because mm. of the digital age. We don't have to settle anymore for the crappy mm. toxic friends that are jealous and want to bring us down. We can connect with anyone at any time. I mean, what you and I are like a hundred and like a hundred miles apart right now. Something, something like, that. like that. Yeah 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 that 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 is tricky because um as you get more i don't know if i want to say enlightened or something like that or more 
uh, you know, we've got these like terms nowadays, like yeah. red pill, woke, uh, <laughs> enlightened, uh, things like that. But introspective, uh, that well, might be the most neutral. something like that. But as you get more um, aware of things in in the world, that there's there's more to them, and mm-hmm. but that uh, yeah, well, it's just that you don't. Um, in the past, you know, you, you would just go with like what was there because that's all that you thought that there was. And mm-hmm. um, we start to realize more and more that like the, the, the more you go in and sort of like, I, you know, again, the, I hate to use terms like enlightened, but the more that you become more aware even even just more smart, more educated, more uh, read more good books, uh, disavow pathological uh, ideological pos- possession, then it's like the kind of people you can really affiliate with and that can really add more to you gets less and less. I mean, um, especially when it's like we're in this weird time too, where it's like you know, people who ha- who are in certain backgrounds or certain ideologies, like even like I used to be a, a lot more involved in like, um, you know, church and the Christian world and all of that and haven't like lost that faith. But it, sometimes it's, it's tricky because they, I say they, which still kind of includes me, but that in that ideology it can be so limiting too of like it has to be only this way and we can't talk to anybody else that doesn't see it this way and if they do then they're like the devil or the enemy kind of thing you know uh, but then and then the same thing with all these different kind of uh you know political ideologies as well where it's like and um these psychological things like you know i'm, I'm getting into more uh you know psychological the psychological field and philosophical things and things but a lot of that whole like liberal arts world is very um in entrenched and enmeshed in the ideological possession of the day you know (laughs) of uh the far left and everything and that that was definitely a lot of the issues that i would come across in the last year especially when it's like i am not a hater of those who espouse those beliefs but i don't want to encourage ideological possession and people sometimes get super mad at me if i just don't amen their like everything is the fault of race and power and everything like that. So that's been really difficult for me too, is that I'm trying to uh, find people in my narrow niche, but at the same time, a lot of those have very ideological uh, values when it's like, if you let your values come from within rather than these ideologies, then we're more like just the same human beings that, can achieve more in the world. So I don't know. And, and, and I mentioned that too, because I know we talked a bit about this before that you had some experience with that too, and you don't need to necessarily get into too much detail, but I think a lot of us have lost some uh, relationships on one level or another, or at least for now, where it's like, just by discussing certain political issues, uh, it, makes certain people see red and not want to be our friends anymore so (laughs) what do you think about that and what's your experience been with that without necessarily getting into much details or or names (laughs) we'll just pour one out for the homies really quick (laughs) (laughs) so a couple of conversations come to mind that actually took place in the last in the last week Mm -hmm. i was on a hike with a good friend of mine and he and i were talking about houses Mm -hmm. He wants a big house. I want a, I mean, my dream right now is a condo in the city, something tiny, something small. Mm. My apartment right now is very tiny. And mm. uh, so we're talking about houses because he sent me this house in Florida that he wants to buy. That's a million dollars. And it's like eight bedrooms, five bathrooms, ridiculous pool on the lake, all this stuff, two car garage, all this. 
And I said, you know, do you want a big house? And he said, yes. And I said, okay. And I stopped the conversation there, but then I waited, a, I waited a little, I waited a little bit. And I said, mm. you know, I said, did you, I said, did you see what I just did there? You had a differing opinion from me and I just accepted it. I didn't ask you, oh, but when you have 17 windows, that means you have to wash 17 windows. Yeah. I didn't tell it. I didn't say like, oh, but think of all the dust that's accumulating every second. And I didn't say, think of all the work that comes along with it. Because in that moment, I understood that we were coming at this from different angles. He right. wanted, he wants a big house. I don't mm. want a big house. Right. Uh, this is funny. Watch, watch us listening to this back in like 10 years. And I live in like a house in the suburbs. Yeah. A million oh, dollar okay. house with like <laughs> eight bedrooms. So he was, and it was a million dollars in Florida too, which is huge. A million dollars in California is the condo in the city. That's my dream. Yep. Um, but so I knew and I understood that though that stuff doesn't matter to him the way it matters to me because mm. our wants are different and he wants it enough to deal with all that. And he doesn't care about the minutia that I care about where mm. I, I want to be the one cleaning my own house. I want to be the own, I want to be the one buying my mm. own food and like probably traveling looking at more. Yeah. Yeah. And, and doing all these things where in his head, he's like, oh, I'll just pay for, I'll, I'll pay to have somebody do that. That stuff doesn't, that stuff doesn't affect me. Mm. And so it's so hard for people to understand that not everyone has the same right. values and not everyone has the same preferences too. Like, like we'll put values aside because we all know that people have different values, but right. it means something different. Like mm. grabbing something from the top shelf means something different to you, Isaac, than it does me. Jade, mm. five foot two. That means, oh yeah, that means a lot. And it's not, it's not a male female thing. It's not even, a, it's not even a height thing. It's yeah. just, it's a thing. Or right, fine, I guess it's a height thing. Yeah, but, there's some girls that are taller than me, so it might be different yeah, for them. Yeah, yeah, of course. And so I asked him. I said, "Why is it so hard for people to just have a conversation like this and just accept that they want something different?" Mm. And I've had, uh, I live a very different lifestyle than 99% of the people that I know. And oftentimes people will try and talk me out of that and they just, they don't understand what it's like. And then the second, mm -hmm. because they can't, we, right. We, we can't ever know what life is mm -hmm. like for anyone else except for ourselves. Right. The other conversation that comes to mind is I was walking home and I live in downtown San Diego mm -hmm. and I saw this big, look like a chow, look like a chow dog, chow chow, but mm -hmm. was something else big white fluffy dog with mm. pink ears and a pink and purple dyed tail and this family and this was on easter so this family okay. was like oh my gosh this dog is amazing let me take pictures and the kids were gossing over it and the parents were like taking pictures of the dog with the kids and the easter eggs and the pink and the purple mm -hmm. and i just cringed because i don't appreciate that kind of i i didn't know i didn't know how the dog felt about it and i, mm. I still to this day don't so I yeah. walked, I walked away, I walked away, but I slowed down and I, I, and I caught the dog owner's attention. I said, Hey, can I, I said, Hey, this is none of my business, but can I ask you something? And she said, sure. I said, how do you know that's not animal abuse? Whoa. Straight to the point. <laughs> I don't mess around. All right, and I like she it. went on, <laughs> she went on to talk about how she said, well, she's a rescue. And I was like, Thinking, you know, and, and it was the moment where I got to practice withholding mm -hmm. judgment or practice patience because <laughs> yeah. I didn't understand in that moment what that had to do with absolutely anything. Yeah. But she said <laughs> the first time, the first time it happened, the groomer just did it without asking. Mm -hmm. She said, she, I don't know if she likes it. She doesn't even know that it's there. The groomer did it without asking and it made her more approachable to people on the street where she's going to have instances like that. Mm -hmm. And so more people were coming up to her and I don't mm -hmm. know if she likes it, but I do think that it helped other people warm up to her and therefore she's having all these little experiences. Mm -hmm. And so it, it doesn't hurt her. It's non-toxic. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, um, it's just something that they, that they wash in and she doesn't know and she doesn't fight it. And so we kept doing it. And I said, wow, all right, that changes how I see the situation. Right. And I feel, I feel the truth is I feel more able to drop an opinion about it because I am not going to say that I like it. I'm not going to say that I support it. I just don't, I'm, I'm not at that point, but it definitely bothers me less. 
And then I actually referenced this. I, I said, thank you, because there's this other dog that walks down downtown San Diego and anyone in, in downtown San Diego will back me up on this, but he's the little reggae dog and his, him and his owner walk around all day with uh, a wheelchair and speakers and the speakers are on the wheelchair, like nobody's in the wheelchair and they give off the, the between houses vibe. And between houses vibe with air quotes for those who are not on video. Okay. And the dog is red. The dog is a little black mini toy poodle with red and yellow and green and dyed into him everywhere on his head, his back, his feet, his legs, everything. Mm. And it makes every, it makes me sad when he walks past and it makes me feel uncomfortable. And usually mm. the other people, if I'm with somebody will, will say something too about it. But while I wasn't going to stop reggae, reggae dog on the street and ask him reggae how he felt dog. about it, yeah. I felt totally comfortable asking this woman. Mm. And I was, I was happy to walk away from that conversation and understand mm. that I don't always know the factors just from mm. looking at a situation. I don't always know. Mm. And I think that is the easiest thing for most people to forget. And I don't know why more people don't have conversations like that. As I hear that, yeah. I think maybe, maybe I might be more confrontational. Than the average person. <laughs> More confrontational. <laughs> mm. uh, maybe. Well, it's all about. Uh, yeah, because well, I don't know. I think a lot of people will see these things contrary to their values, we'll say. And then sometimes maybe, uh, and, and to put it sort of in Petersonian terms, is your your level of agreeableness so some people might have mm -hmm. a high level of agreeableness which obviously you don't <laughs> and <laughs> they would be more like oh uh just assume the dog must love uh this thing going on to it this hair dye whatever mm -hmm. um and it, it's it's hard to say in either case maybe they do maybe they don't uh that, 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 and see animal stuff is weird because you can't really get their opinion on a survey you know <laughs> like <laughs> if, if it's if it's a kid for example and, and kids are even tough too because like kids can be like yeah i'm a woman or, or whatever <laughs> and mm, maybe but maybe they're just you know when, when it's a kid they haven't really developed you know your brain doesn't develop until you're about well your age or fully develop mm -hmm. anyway um so so yes and so we, we have these contrary values or or, pe or we, we often run into people with contrary values to our own and then it's like how do we handle that and be because ultimately sort of to the you know topic of today it's like we want to find people with values that align with ours and hopefully want people that won't backstab us anyway <laughs> um and the other thing i want to mention too like you mentioned the word primal or something like that earlier and, yeah. and that we have this primal nature about all of this and that's how that we can kind of like do these things even unconsciously of this unconscious envy and um the reason i think that's important is because you know in our primal world so to speak when we are more of the hunter gatherer type so to speaker like that we might theorize you know everything really was about uh how much resources you can get you know that's why like why you see like right now you can like put food in front of dogs and they'll fight over it um humans on the other hand at least here in the uh modern world where we have abundant physical resources um it's it's about uh, you know, the meta food or the information food or the, because our environment is so social, it's about the social world. So it's less about like, oh, did we, you know, get to eat this uh, woolly mammoth or did we uh, not get the marrow from that uh, saber tooth tiger or whatever. Mm -hmm. and, and it's more about uh, like, like you mentioned that girl, like, oh, you make me look like shit, you know, <laughs> because mm -hmm. what happens when like each other, however, consciously or unconsciously or intentional or not, it might've been that 
somebody you know makes the other person look like crap or whatever um or you know you, you start people might start to see another person as the enemy because um that's really what's important is the social world now uh mm. is you know if we and and that gets into the whole like you know lobster hierarchy to you know stay with peterson sort of terms is that we have these social hierarchies or dominance counters constantly going on and it's it's in our serotonin uh like dominance counter system unconsciously and so if we see somebody around us like subverting us in the dominance hierarchy that can happen but yeah it's like now we've got to figure out how to integrate that to where that we can help each other off the dominance hierarchy instead of like push each other around as yeah. we try to ascend and it's tricky how to um uh, how to deal with that when it happens on both sides. When you see somebody like trying to kick you off the dominance hierarchy ladder and, or you, or you try to help, help somebody up or, it, or get helped up. And then, mm-hmm. uh, you know, spe- and you see it more so in like the corporate world. It's, you know, like, it's like the whole dog eat dog, you know, uh, backstabbing world, but same thing just in the social environment when, you know, you're dealing with young girls or <laughs> young people that's like, they, they've got to look a certain way. And if they don't, then it's like, you know, screw you, bitch. I hate you. <laughs> you know? So, uh, yeah. but I don't know. It sounds like you, I, I, I'm intuiting that you've had some experience with this as you nod your yeah. head. Yeah. Yeah. I think most people, I think most people have, but what comes to mind for me is that mm when that fear response get tri- gets triggered mm-hmm. and these primal structures in right. your brain get activated, the newer parts of your brain, the, the part of you that's you doesn't have time to catch up and respond. Right. It's already too late. There's already, there, there's already been a cascade of emotions mm-hmm. and by emotions, I mean, um, you know, your endocrine system and, and the hormones, it, it's already fired before you even get the chance to be like, wait, this is somebody that I love. I'm, I, I'm happy mm-hmm. for them. And so that's why so much of this, I hate to say the word, but so much of this wellness movement is mm-hmm. about slowing down, meditating, creating space. So that way you can literally build stru- structures in your brain that are going to help you get out of your active. lizard brain and into your frontal lobes. There you go. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And Jason Goldberg, okay. who is a an author and coach, wrote a book called Prison Break. Mm. And one of the chapters was talking about how when you see somebody you envy, maybe somebody you went to school with who's doing a little bit better than you, or maybe mm. somebody that um, you just, who is similar to you. And it's just, I don't know, something about it makes you feel insecure. Mm-hmm. He says that you can use that as inspiration for what can happen. Right. But I also took it to mean to look at that and say, to look at what I want. Going back to the house example, if one of my friends has a huge house, that's not going to get to me because as long as you don't have to live in it with them for some reason. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. As long as I, as long as I'm not there, but if someone has, let me think about something that I want that is appropriate, appropriate to share. If somebody has like a perfectly straight spine that they achieved from somatic. Okay. <laughs> uh, everybody, everybody listening at home, I have scoliosis. My spine is shaped like an S. Okay. Uh, no. So if somebody has something that Sorry I Sorry for being want, born with such a great spine. <laughs> well, that, a, a, another callback. Okay. Another callback. That's why I'm five two. If I didn't have scoliosis, I would be taller. Oh, okay. Like then you'd, you'd be closer to being able to reach things on the top shelf. Yep. Yep. Then top shelves would be no, no, no issue. problem. Mm-hmm. No issue. And you no can just, <laughs> all right. 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 And so it's like when, when you get jealous, when you feel that tinge of jealousy, mm. never about the things that you don't want. It's always about something that you do. It's always about something that you do want or something similar that you see for yourself. And then you learn, mm-hmm. you know, you learn what you care about sometimes mm. from, from that moment. And so that was how I actually learned that I wanted to go to I think maybe that's why I want, I eventually went 
why I ultimately went to college because I didn't get into UCSD. Mm. And I was like, whoa, whoa, I'm so hurt by the projection. That's how it went in your head. Whoa, this is horrible. This is really hurts, bro. <laughs> <laughs> whoa. Yeah. So, and so then I was like, you know what? I'm going to go to SDSU and I'm going to mm. kick ass at it. And I like joined the, the honors program for a little bit, but that ended after a few years. And um, yeah, so I, I think remembering to focus on yourself is the best, best possible thing to do in that situation. Mm -hmm. And again, it comes back to the the best advice ever, right? Focus on what you can control, not what right. you can't control. Very stoic. So can you, can I control that you have a straight spine? No, I can't. <laughs> but you, well, but you can control, well, and that's sort of like your testimony as a somatics uh, person that you are and that you can't control how you were born genetically and whatever else led to your scoliosis. But mm -hmm. uh, to this point that you bring up, uh, you've learned other things to control and deal with the life that you have. And now, thanks to what you've learned in somatics and other things, um, you've been able to ha have a good life where otherwise you'd probably be like a, a just bitter, sad, sick person. So I, I don't know, maybe you can mention something on that at least briefly, so, since that's your whole thing. Just on the scoliosis piece or well, the somatic yeah, piece really quick? Well, at least in that, um, that's something that you could control. And so you, you did, and therefore uh, you have made yourself better where you could have just stayed in that sort of like low envy state, but instead you learn to rise above yeah. it and make the most of yourself. Yeah. So I have scoliosis and mm. I went from regularly prescribed muscle relaxants and up to three times weekly chiropractic and PT visits. And that's three separate for each of those. And they had me on Benzo a little bit to mm. being completely pain-free and not even carrying ibuprofen in my purse, which is a pretty dramatic transformation. And as cool as that is for the physical stuff, what it really did was open up my mind because mm. If I wasn't having a back spasm, I was afraid of when the next one was going to come. Right. And that's not really a great place to live from. Right. I think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? I mean, I was pretty, I was pretty uh, interrupted, I would say, where I couldn't really finish a train of thought because I was in that much pain or mm -hmm. fear. And then something changed where I decided to put everything into what I could change mm -hmm. and what I couldn't. And so while I couldn't change the physical shape of my spine because my spine is still shaped like an ass. I'm still five, two guys, unfortunately, Okay. sadly, <laughs> but nothing wrong with that. You, you say that, <laughs> you say that like you're four, two, like, well, the thing is, okay. So you, in your brain is an entire map of your body. Sure. Your brain knows, you know, your brain has a map in your sensory motor cortex. It's called the motor homunculus of yep. like where your body parts is. Mm. So I have the neurons for those vertebrae, but they're not stacked right. Mm. So I think I'm taller than I am. And oftentimes <laughs> I always forget. So it is a totally yeah. like a, a complete how, how tall do you think you are that you're not? Oh, at least five, seven. At oh, least five, wow. seven. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. girl. <laughs> <laughs> One day we'll get there. Maybe we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we'll, so, we'll okay. get there. so I couldn't change the brain. Mm. I mean, well, no, that's the most incorrect thing I've ever said, because you can change your brain. I couldn't right. change the vertebrae. Right. I, but what I could change was the surrounding muscles. Mm -hmm. And so the muscles were super tight and I was able to change the relationship between um, my sensory motor cortex and the brain to get those tight muscles to stop firing. So they would lengthen mm -hmm. and lengthened muscles are just looser, more comfortable, less painful. And because the actual body that I'm living in started to improve. So did my outlook on life because no longer was I sitting around in fear of like, well, actually I can't come to the movies with you because I think my back is going to hurt. And mm -hmm. now I'm upset that I can't go out with my friends and all I can do is really like lay around and drink. You're such an overcomer. <laughs> I suppose. Well, you, I suppose you, I well, am. Um, yeah, because it, this kind of gets into a, a couple issues that I wanted to at least touch on, which is, um, well, so one, uh, the only thing I didn't like about this chapter was it didn't do much with the positive side of this question of, you know, how to have like mm. 
like real good friendships it's just more focused on the uh how we fall into negative relationships and that's important to understand and everything um but when i was kind of preparing for this i you know searched for some other videos on youtube and what one that you know jordan peterson was just doing like a q a on his channel or whatever a couple years ago and somebody kind of reminded me of of you who's a person had said that they had a, a lot of friendships uh because they're extroverted but they're very shallow friendships for the most part um. so the question is like how to get more like depth of friendship rather than just like number of them which i think is important because um that's especially an issue right now in you know this cyber age that we live in where we might have you know 500 or 5000 facebook friends or whatever and we might have uh a lot of acquaintances uh but we don't ha it, like it used to always be that everybody would have you know at least four or five really good close friends and now people barely have that anymore they might have one or two or three mm -hmm but they barely have close relationships anymore anymore. Um, anyway, so one of the uh, solutions that he gave, which I thought was really good is he, he's like, try, like, it's fine to do like, have your regular hangouts, like go to the bar or whatever. Um, there's nothing wrong with doing that a lot of times, but that's more of like gaining and establishing um uh, you know, the, the, the more surface type of friendships and, and that's fine to help maintain those too. And maybe they can become more, but if you really want depth of friendship or relationships, it's um, doing things profound together is kind of the way that he put it. And so um, like what you've done, even just with your scoliosis and that you share that with like a community and that you've got a little bit of a, online following or, or whatever um, that builds a, a network of things of people, you know, healing their, their bodies, their minds, their lives. And like, that's sort of like what I try to get at with this channel as much as that I can. And, you know, it's like doing things profound rather than just staying in this like surface primal minutia that we can get into. So, mm -hmm. uh, what do you think? How do, and, and I don't know, have you had like thoughts and experience on that of like trying to do more things profound with people and that helping to develop more depth of relationship than just shallow ones? Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, I score in the 99th percentile for oh, yeah. extroversion, which is one of my favorite things about myself and also <laughs> translates into, I go outside and I meet interesting people. Mm -hmm. I go outside in any city, any part of the world, and I, I start a conversation with someone or someone starts a conversation with me. We exchange info. It's another contact in my phone. It's another friend. It's, mm -hmm. it's as if I can go, it's as if I can make friends anywhere. Mm -hmm. And it's the, it is exactly what you just talked about, where it's like the keeping of the friend or going, going deeper, going to a different level is not that easy. It's not like that. Right. And I, I have a really clear distinction in my head between mm. um, what a friend is to me and what a close friend is mm -hmm. and what a best friend is. Oh, and I always us. wanted oh, that. <laughs> I always wanted a best friend. Like I wanted that like Jade and so-and-so, or, you know, I wanted that, that title, that identity, but I never, I never had mm. it. And that's completely and understandably fine. So there's a lot, there's, there's a, a few different people I would, I've, interchangeably call my best friend, probably only two people. Mm -hmm. And then close friends are the people that would, that actually know me and mm -hmm. would, that I would trust a little bit more with more, more delicate things or more private things. Mm -hmm. And then I have a very loose definition of friend. Okay. So <laughs> I work with, I, I worked, I worked, um, once upon a time I worked in a bar and I met a whole bunch of people through there. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, sometimes we'll see each other around town or do taco Tuesday or visit somebody else who's working and get like uh, seltzer and they'll get, they'll get beers and stuff. Cause I don't drink that much. Mm -hmm. And, and those are friends. 
mm. to me. But I mean, if I was like skipping town and somebody had to come watch my cat, I wouldn't necessarily call them, mm. I would say. But I think that when you lower your standard for what mm. a friend is, or you just up your standard or you mm. up what it means to be an acquaintance or acquaintance or something that somebody that you know, mm. then there's a lot of, there's a lot of playroom in that. And there's a lot of wiggle room where you can meet a whole bunch of really interesting people. And though you may only hang out a couple of times and follow each other on social media, or mm. you just reach out years and years later, like shout out to my friend Rainy, who's super awesome. Mm. And she was really into, she's really into personality types. Mm -hmm. And she, she and I met on a bus from New York city to Baltimore in 2016. Okay. And we just sat, she just happened to sit next to me. We started up a conversation. We ended up talking the full four hours wow. and I was able to just mention her, my personality and different personality types of the people that were in my inner circle at that time. And she was like, oh, so I bet you guys do this all the time. Or like, oh, I bet he misinterprets that blah, blah, blah. And it was like, she knew right. us from, mm. it was like, she knew us. So I think that so much of, so much of friendship is about what you and the other person are bringing to the table. Mm -hmm. And if you have something that you're super interested in and so does somebody else, mm -hmm. and they happen to be like vaguely loosely similar, mm -hmm in even the slightest way, then you can, you can be friends with that person. But I'm, I might actually be the worst person to ask for advice on how to make friends because you're I'm too good at it. <laughs> I'm not literally in the 99% You do it without even actually. thinking about it. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing. And it's like, um, I was walking down the street and a woman complimented my jacket and I complimented her boots. We exchanged numbers, went to coffee and like, by the end of the second time we were hanging out, she was like in tears confessing like her whole life story to me mm. and being like, wow, I'm so happy we met. Wow. Not practical. Doesn't happen every day. I understand that now. Mm. And so whenever people are like, oh, I'm struggling to make friends. It's so hard to make friends as an adult. Da, 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 da. I'm like, just go outside. But I'm starting just to like, I, I realize that, just go outside. Mm. Just talk to people. But I realized that's not actually practical. That's not everybody's experience. Well, and I, I will say that um, as a more introverted person uh, who has to work a little bit harder on, on those things, uh, okay, a couple things. Well, one, like, again, as I was kind of preparing and looking at some other angles with this topic with Jordan Peterson, you know, he was saying how that, like, some of his clients would have a lot of social anxiety, but then going from barely being able to talk to a new person to being almost on the Jade Sabansky level, it can happen, <laughs> but it takes, uh, it's, it's a learned skill that takes, uh, you know, diligent work for years to do, to develop, uh, which, which mm -hmm. actually is kind of important because sometimes he gives a little bit of a doom and gloom sort of like, if you don't learn by the time <laughs> you're, you're four years old, you're screwed <laughs> just, just because there, there's a lot of literature for that, but, it, it, but it's true that you're not going to have that naturally, like that natural socialization. Like you must have had a great time until you're four years old or, or whatever. Uh, <laughs> but you, you can, you can learn it. It's just going to take more practice. And I heard somebody give this analogy um, in that, you know, every, everybody like, like these personality types of, you know, introvert, extrovert, or, uh, you know, sensing, intuiting, uh, mm -hmm. thinking, feeling, uh, the big And then five. judging versus perceiving. Yeah. Well, everybody has all of that, but they're inferior. It's just unconscious and you can let it out mm. in, in certain situations. And so, uh, Sometimes you, like a lot of people don't know the movie Harold and Kumar. Do you know the movie Harold and Kumar? Only by name. Mm, okay. So basically uh, Harold is this guy, they're, they're like stoners, but uh, Harold is kind of like the uptight conservative, like very like, uh, you know, Asian American, gotta be a successful accountant kind of guy. 
And Kumar is kind of the opposite of like, we just got to like have fun and live in the moment kind of guy. And uh, the, the analogy is that when you're going to go and like socialize, so to speak, it's easy to fall in the trap, especially for more like introverted thinking or just introverted at all to just like be like a herald who's all like, oh, well, here's how I would solve your problem. And, you know, uh, like, mm -hmm. let me look at your PTS report and uh, <laughs> whatever else. And especially because like that might work in the uh, corporate environment or your work environment or wherever that you're successful. And so then you go around trying to like sit, solve everybody's problems by doing their taxes and uh, you know, balancing out all the variables and whatever. But really, they just need somebody to listen and to hang out with. And so basically, it's like you've got both of those personalities inside of you, but you've got to learn to like let the other one out more when you're out socializing or you're, you're out being around people. Um, so either be more of the like uh, fun in the moment person when you're around people, or if you can't do that, all you introverts out there, at least get good at listening to people even if you're not good mm -hmm. at it just act like it and then there will go uh, like really good friendships it's just you have to and if you do that you actually will get good at having friendships then the only challenge mm -hmm. then becomes uh like we're talking we've been talking about already is then then you have to start being picky because yeah maybe that's the other topic to uh, get to for a minute is uh the the sort of like easy thing and maybe it's more like a primordial evolutionary thing is that we just kind of like gravitate to the easiest thing and the easiest thing is to like mm -hmm. have relationships with people that are easy to have relationships with and those aren't always the, the right ones we have to sometimes do the hard thing which is you know we don't have to necessarily ghost people or tell them off or anything but just like disappear into the sunset if a person is, I mean, well, cause the thing is, is like, I don't like the idea of like, I got to ghost a person or tell a person like, screw you. You're not like following my values, but um, you just have to kind of like distance yourself from a person. I mean, there are exceptions, like some of the ones that we've dealt with recently where it's like, people will cuss us out or whatever. <laughs> and in those <laughs> cases, we, we might even have to block them or whatever the case. Yeah. And, that, and that might be, and so now we like have two topics, two or three topics to get in with only a few more minutes left. But one is uh, how to deal with uh, saying no to easy relationships just because they're easy to try to, uh, because we only have so much friendship space. I, I think that's how we get stuck sometimes. We get like having easy friendships so then when maybe a better friendship would present itself, it doesn't go there because we've got like five or 10 okay, horrible friendships. When if we like, we're distancing ourselves from the horrible friendship, we'd be ready for the really cool, important friendship. Um, and then the other issue is how to deal with it when like somebody attacks you or, or cusses you out or shows you that ugly side, like, it's a tough oh thing. God. What do you what do you think, Jay? Because we've got like I don't oh, know, I think ten or fifteen minutes, so solve all the world's problems. <laughs> Go. I think so much about this. I really do. I think a lot okay, about good. it. Well, the first the first thing I want to say is that mm -hmm. I have a really really wonderful wonderful friend who is actually my sweet mate in Chicago mm -hmm. more than a decade ago, mm -hmm. and I spent the week with her not too not too long ago, and I realized like wow this is what life should feel like. And this is what life should be like. And it almost is like subconsciously since then I've been kind of holding everyone else to that standard mm -hmm. where we just got along great. We did everything that we wanted to do. It was, um, I mean, we were like just eating. The only thing we ate that week were like vegetables and salads and some quinoa. And pretty much the only thing that we did was like hike. I don't know a lot of people who are going to do that. I don't know a lot, a lot of people who are going to do that with me, but it was just like in Chicago so are, are there any hikes in Chicago? <laughs> we were no we were we, we were uh we were out of state okay and anyway um so it wasn't even just about like oh I want a vegan who's athletic it's like I want somebody who treated me the way that she treats me because she treated me like a person and that was right. really 
I, I didn't realize how many people weren't treating me like that. Mm. So I recently had to say bye to a longtime friend who I also have known for uh, over 10 years. Mm -hmm. And it got to the point where she was asking me to do something I was uncomfortable with. And I flat mm -hmm. out said, you know, and it was, incre it was incremental. Like it wasn't the first time, like I wasn't surprised that she asked me. I was like, oh my God, she's trying to cross the line. It was like, mm. oh, I should have known. And so mm. um, I was very, very worried about her and she was very hysterical and very upset. I said, look, I can do this thing, but I need you to get help. And she just blew up on me and was Whoa. like, I'm already, I'm already getting help. I don't need to tell you my mm. life story, all this stuff. And so then I was like, oh my God, what do I do? So then, and, and this was like in person, um, six feet apart. Ha ha ha. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Screaming so, at you from six feet away. Yeah, we were both, we were both wearing that. Yeah. So two masks uh, each. Ah, doing so good. We got to what minute without talking about politics? <laughs> yeah. No. It's so, funny that that's, that's political, but anyway, I know, yeah, yeah. I know. So anyways, it is, um, go ahead. she was so upset and she's like, no one will do this for me. Please. I asked so many people, they're saying no for, for no reason. So I said, all right, I'm going to do it for, I'm going to do this for you. Uh, she wanted me to send a message to someone. And I said, but then I'm blocking them. I'm blocking you and I'm leaving. And she said, okay. And it was like, she Whoa, said a whole bunch of other stuff. She said a whole dang. bunch of other stuff. That's but dark. I was just like, all right, That's so dark. she doesn't, doesn't care about me, doesn't care about the friendship. Mm. So I, just, I did that. I left. Yeah, the, the, you're just an object at that point. You're yeah. just like a means to an end. Yeah. And I've so, had some relationships yes. like that. I won't get into it because it's more of like my at least one ex-girlfriend. that. Personal? Yeah, um, well, it's just like using a person as a means to an end rather than as a person. But I mean, yes. tell us more, Jade. Yes, exactly. So I, I, I really did it. I left. And by this point, it was like two in the morning. Mm. And she was like, just stay over. I was like, I am not comfortable here. And so mm. I left, I went home. And then the next day she texted me from another number. And I was what? like, oh I, was like I was like, I was like, and she apologized. And she's like, mm. oh, come back. Da, da, da. And I was like, that, that's not how this works. When somebody blocks mm. you, they don't want to talk to you anymore. So um, fast forward about a month and I'm out to dinner with somebody I really care about and mm. respect and value their opinion. Mm -hmm. as much like maybe maybe more than anyone or as much as I value anyone's opinion mm -hmm. and so I was telling him like so this thing happened and this went down da, da, da. I'm like why am I still in a position where I'm like shedding toxic friendships like I thought it thought this was behind me like I haven't had to deal with this in like five years I'm like what is it about what is it da, 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 you know it's like and mm -hmm. then I realized what a weight was lifted out of my life as soon as like after blocking her and not and knowing that she can't call or text and I was like, wow, I feel so much better. Like just, I walk around easier. I didn't even know that that weight was there. I was mm -hmm. like, could you relate to this? And yeah. um, my friend was like, no. I said, what? <laughs> he said, I don't know. I mean, I guess maybe I had like one toxic friend in college, but like, I guess mm -hmm. I just don't let people have that kind of power over me. And yeah. I was like, whoa, bars. Because bars. I couldn't even refute it. <laughs> I couldn't even refute it. I couldn't yeah. say, what are you talking about? She didn't have power over me, but it was like, mm. they did. They did have yeah. this like subconscious, subconscious hold over me. And then I was looking at my adorable dogs and I was like, mm. oh yes, you do run my emotions. You do have everything over mm. me. You could, if you wow. could like, I will, I will bend to your will for, for anything. And so it made me stop and think wow. and realize like, if people are going to leave my life, they're allowed to leave my life and that's fine. I don't want to be upset about it. And so I kind of vowed to like, never let that happen again. Mm. And then, and then two weeks later, somebody else that I really care about, we also had to say goodbye to, <laughs> and that mm. was, a, that one was, that one was a little bit different. I think I, uh, it, it also got to the point where I had to block them, but I like left email open or maybe they're, maybe they're still on my Facebook or something. Like I left, like I, I didn't block all of the lines of communication, just, mm. just primary ones. And, uh, that got to the point where. I kind of was just like, I just had to, I, I had to do it. I, I had, I wasn't getting through to this person. And I realized that I was cutting them to way, way, way too many breaks because I have a, I have a two-year-old cousin named Elliot and I have okay. a dog named Theodore. And I was thinking to myself, like, hmm. if, 
if Elliot was doing two year old stuff, yeah. I wouldn't get mad at him. Mm. If if Theodore was doing Pomeranian right. things, I wouldn't get mad at him. So why am I getting mad at this person for just being who he is? Mm. But then I realized, wait, that's completely BS. He's not a he's not a toddler. Right, he's not right. a dog. He's a grown man, and he shouldn't be treating me this way. Right. And I mm. just had I, I just had to cut communication. So I ended up um, blocking that person for now. And it's been it's been interesting um, to see how that has been playing out. Really. Has there been a, any situations where maybe not to that extent, but like you thought you might have to end a relationship, so to speak, but you found a way to redeem it because sometimes that hmm. decision needs to be made and it's a tough yeah. one. Maybe you need to give the person yeah. two or three or four chances, but, or I don't know. Can you relate yeah. to that? because that that's a oh, tough absolutely. place where, where wisdom starts to come in. What, what do you think? I, yeah, absolutely. I had a friend um, and I'm still, I'm still friends with this person or I'm friends mm -hmm. with this person again is the truest thing that we could say, but it got to the point where it was pretty toxic and I had mm -hmm. to cut ties, but then actually, you know, the, sometimes the strangest things can affect you. Or sometimes you could be primed for something and mm -hmm. then something will happen and you'll use that as an excuse to do what you already wanted to do. Right. Mm -hmm. So I hadn't talked to this woman for about a year and a half or two years. And then Mac Miller passed away. Mm -hmm. And for mm -hmm. some reason, for both of us, that was a trigger of like, oh, my God, life is too short. Mm -hmm. And because um, somebody we used to listen to. And so then I went back to her. And she apologized and I forgave her and mm. like she welcomed me back with open arms. Mm. And then um, our relationship is definitely stronger now than it was seven or eight years ago because we both just had to grow up, grow up in that time. And right. uh, so that's the only, that might be the only instance or stuff like that has happened where it just isn't working out. You try mm. your hardest. It gets to the point where you walk away, you walk away. Mm. Sometimes it comes back. Sometimes it works out. So I think of, sometimes I think of people as having four animal natures. And this just kind of helps me sort that out because it's inside everyone and it's in uh, the dynamics of relationships or groups. So the, the four animal natures are the snake or dragon, the, mm. sh the sheep, the wolf, and the scorpion. And the, the reason that I put them in those four categories, and it's just kind of something that I came up with after reading a lot of um, mythology and things. But the, the reason is because uh, sheep, you can just let be sheep. The wolf, you can let eat another sheep, which is unfortunate, but uh, it doesn't have to eat you. The dragon, Oof. the dragon, you can tame. Uh, or slay and sometimes that's mm. that's something to to work out although the thing with slaying a dragon is it will always come back so it's better if you can tame mm. it but sometimes it's hard to tame a dragon after it gets so big and again these are natures inside of everyone but then the scorpion nature is that where you just have to walk away or distance from yourself from it because the scorpions will just be scorpions and they will um eventually disintegrate themselves you know it's kind of like there's this mythology story of that where it's like the scorpion uh, the scorpion uh talks a frog into giving the scorpion mm -hmm. a ride a ride across the the river or the lake and the mm. and the scorpion the the frog's like well if i let you do that wouldn't wouldn't you kill me because you're like wouldn't that be the thing like aren't i putting myself in danger and he says uh no if we just both get across the pond then we'll both be the better for it and i won't uh sting you and he gets across the pond and this as soon as they do the scorpion stings the frog and kills him and the frog's like ribbit why and the scorpion just says it's because i'm a scorpion uh 
So that's that's the thing I think to discern is, and and we de- we deal with this in our own nature, and we deal with it in those relationships around us, and that's inside every single person, and that they can be a sheep, a wolf, a scorpion or a snake that becomes the dragon. And so we yeah. have to bring out the best in each other. And which is really a matter of like bringing out the, the fifth, which is the, the human hero. Um, and so that's, that's a, a lifelong process of bringing out the, the best in those in our social environment. Um, yeah. But what do you think? Yeah, I think about that all the time. I heard the version where the scorpion actually stings the frog halfway across to the pond and they both drown. Yeah. And the frog's like, why? And the scorpion's like, it's in my nature. Yeah, it's my nature. And mm-hmm. um, and like I said, these these kind of natures are inside of all of us where um and you have to discern being around this person or in this group or in this situation, is that going to bring out more of my toxicity? Cause we all have a level of toxicity that if we're not careful, it can come, come out, bubble yeah. out, whatever, or, uh, and me being around like, um, hmm. so if anybody's listening, uh, <laughs> there aren't many people that would listen, <laughs> but cause I haven't shared, shared this very, uh, publicly, but, uh, uh what happened with that, relationship I had with well if I uh, say much that's it's obvious who it is but with the guy I did the uh, the most podcast with uh, Dr. Lahaval Samurai um, leading up to that and we had hung out a lot become friends perhaps a little bit of a mentor figure he had this like anything would trigger him into like going on these rants against conservatives against uh, Mm. trump against um uh jordan peterson but Mm. i was learning a lot from him in this area of you know Jungian psychology and things that i was interested in and so i developed the habit of just like ignoring that um and then the last podcast that we did together um you know because in a lot of podcasts he would kind of do that and i would just like try to divert it back to like okay we're not talking about the evils of capitalism today and we can maybe have a cap a podcast on that uh because of course it has capitalism and things like that have their pros and cons that we need to deal with in society but uh we can talk about that another time and so in the last podcast that we did that was not aired um he would continue to go on that and it's like okay uh let's let's do that on another podcast but today we're talking about this it's the chapter eight in the book or whatever that we're going over and i don't know he might have i'm not gonna go into too much detail but uh basically he's like no i want to talk about this and so i'm like anyway i snapped on him a little bit it's like dude you're like becoming this like totalitarian like thing that you keep accusing trump of being by you will not let us talk about anything else. And uh, the the thing was too, is that we both like said, hey, you know, we're under a lot of stress right now. This is January with this like drag out election. Uh, sorry, let's like continue doing our stuff together and everything else. Um, and then, and so we thought we had, I thought we had worked it out in the like coming days after that. And we went and we actually recorded another version of that podcast that I thought we would air and then the next day when I thought we were cool, he just sends me one text and goes to me like, we're not going to work together anymore. And then he deletes all the podcasts that we had together <laughs> off of his thing. Oh. Yeah. And, and so it was like this whole thing where it's like almost like the, um, I don't know, like Leonardo da Vinci and uh, Michelangelo, not that we're like at that level of artistry or whatever, but where it's like, we have these values, but that are aligned but these other ones that are not and that they can kind of take over if we're not careful uh so that was in that was that experience and that you know it's like i almost wanted to be like please you know (laughs) like but what i realized was happening too is that i was like repressing my um 
you know, my own values. And that causes, that actually caused me to snap a little bit. I mean, it wasn't anything bad. I'm just like, like raised my voice on a podcast. Like, come on, let's like talk about what we're supposed to talk about. And I guess he got really upset about that. But the whole uh, point of that story is we have to try our best to stay on the line of, or on the path of, uh, like I posted, I think yesterday, and like we, those we have re relationships with, we recreate the world in the image of those that we have relationships with. And so if we, and, or at least our own world, our own social environment. And so if we do it in this like willfully blind or unconsciously blind, um, justifying toxicity or, or whatever the case, like they keep getting you to do bad habits or whatever the case, or uh, bend on your values, then it's gonna only get worse and worse and worse until a decision has to be made. And yeah. so the sooner you make that decision, the, the better. Um, but I don't know. What do you think? We've only got a couple more minutes. And I know you've got <laughs> to get going. The, I know it's so hard when they're like ties that we care about and mm. it's completely out of our power or control or right. when it's just so obviously about the other person, right, 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 for right. instance. Mm -hmm. And that was the beautiful dark gift in... Oh, that was my, that, excuse me, everybody. That was my e-break, but we're fine. We're, we're okay. Okay. So, so the thing is that the most recent, uh, no longer friend, what do we call people who aren't our friends anymore? Person, people? Ex, ex friend, <laughs> so most, I don't know. Ex, ex, so the most recent person that I mm. chose to cut out of my life mm. said not only the meanest things that mm. she's ever said, Mm -hmm. about anyone or to me mm -hmm. or about me in 10 years of knowing this person through good and bad, mm -hmm. but also the meanest things anyone has said to me ever. Wow. And this is coming from somebody that like was, um, I totally thought of as like sweet and innocent and kind and mm -hmm. caring and nurturing and really good, like um, selfless vibes and everything. So it was a total shock. Right. But it was obvious to me that this person was spinning out mm. and going through an extraordinarily hard time an extraordinary, like a really, really, really stressful situation, no doubt. Mm. But also that's not my, that's not my responsibility. And mm. I can't tolerate people saying awful things like that to me mm. uh, in the moment. I mean, he basically used 10 years of intimate details that I told him about wow. myself against me <laughs> in like an hour. That's the worst right there. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> and so after, after that conversation, I mean, I was so like jacked up on mm. um, just shock. Like we were talking right. about earlier with the, with the Jordan Peterson betrayal that I actually, mm. I didn't sleep. A, I didn't sleep a minute that night. afterwards. Wow. But what did hit me was how I didn't, and I didn't get upset. I didn't cry. I didn't lash out. I didn't say anything hurtful back to him. I didn't, um, you know, I didn't, I, I, I actually didn't take it personally. It was shocking. It was unpleasant. I didn't like it. I definitely did not like it at all, mm. but I didn't take it. I didn't take it in. I didn't take it personally. And I just instantly forgave him as mm. soon as it happened. And I remember, uh, just realizing like, Oh, wait a minute. And it helped me just having that moment of clarity and just very clearly seeing that this really didn't have anything to do with me. And mm. even though he was trying to, right. even though he was trying to hurt me, it wasn't my hurt to receive something about it in my brain just shifted and clicked and instantaneously. Yeah, it's not personal. It's his thing. Yes. And instantaneously I was able to forgive my roommate mm. for like, for something that mm. I had been holding on to for like mm. six months. Wow. And I was like, whoa, what a gift this is that mm -hmm. I totally see the parallel here and how I'm able to use that in this other situation. And so ever since, so it's only been about a week now, I've mm -hmm. just been like, I feel lighter. I feel like, okay, yeah, great. Yeah. Like, yeah, wait, that actually wasn't about me. Oh, that really mm -hmm. was an accident. Oh, right. that really was a mistake. Whereas before I'm like, how could they do this to me? Right, the world right, right. doesn't make sense. The sky mm -hmm. is falling, you know? So right. that's, that was really the upside in all this was getting to use mm -hmm. that 
to my advantage in that way. And this person who just exited my life just very clearly doesn't want to be friends with me right now. And I think that that's fine. If they don't want me in their life, that is fine. And I think that um, it's quite evident that he'd been lying to himself for some time about whether or not he wanted to be friends with me. And Hmm. then it just doesn't work. You just, you can only lie to yourself for so long. And I think that uh, it seemed like a last ditch, ditch attempt to like maybe burn a bridge because that was the only way he could conceive of, he couldn't actually walk up to me and be like, Hey Jade, I don't want to be friends with you. Hmm. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll close with this thought. Cause I know we're over time, but that I, I forget where exactly the quote come, came from, but it's like when any two people have a relationship or a connection or communication, there is inherently like another person between them. And so, um, so when it, sometimes it's that the person between two people becomes what we don't like and therefore we have to end it or, or they have to end it or it becomes toxic. But um, anyway, I think you got to go. So I'll let you say your goodbyes and everything and then we'll put, um, uh, or we, we can go a couple more, more minutes or I don't yeah, know, but, okay. but anyway, uh, <laughs> say what you want and we'll wrap it up when you want. And, um, it's all good. Yeah. Well, I would, I guess I would want to say that to anybody listening to this, who maybe has had to deal with toxic friends and mm. finding the balance between when to walk and when to work on it mm. to just really put yourself first. Mm. Um, because that's what, that's the best thing that you could do. Cause if these other people put themselves first, they Mm -hmm. wouldn't have felt the need to lash out on me. And if I would, if they didn't lash out, then I wouldn't have cut them off. And Mm -hmm. um, I know it's kind of awkward to think about like prioritizing yourself for a lot of us because we want to just, it's so much easier to help other people. Mm -hmm. It really is. And Jordan Peterson talks about that a lot too, but right. Even in this chapter, sometimes, yeah. Yeah. Sometimes we have to let people go and we can learn from it and use it. And even if we can't use it or learn from it, then it's an instance where we get to practice not making things worse. So for example, like with this whole shindig going down recently, I mean, 10 years ago, I wouldn't be able to handle it the way I am now. Right. It totally would have like ruined a lot, a lot for me. Mm. And then the other thing that I wanted to say too is mm. for people who are looking for friends, mm. just put yourself out there. Right. And when you, if you find something in life that you care about and you're passionate about and you love it so much, you want to share it, share it with other people, you're naturally, you're naturally going to attract not only just other people, but the right kinds of people. Yeah. And, and then the other uh, thing I want to mention on this note is just that what, what we're really looking for is people that we can be honest with for the right reasons. Um, and that that's mainly to help each other grow because sometimes um, that that's tricky because one, the, the paradox that sort of solves is one, we often find people that maybe it's like they get in the like self-help world or psychology world mm-hmm. or the like do good world, but they're just doing it to make themselves feel better or, mm-hmm. or, or they, they get to this, they develop a certain persona, which is like, I'm this good person because I'm like, whatever, whether it's in a church or it's the self-help psychology, whatever world. And, oh, it's like, and then you, you like show your uh, a vulnerability or an imperfection. They're like, oh, get away, get away, get away. You know, so you don't even want to be around those people that act all perfect because they're not, they're just like hiding their scorpions that'll just come out later. Uh, but, the, but then also you, so you want to be, be able to be honest with people for the purpose of growth. So you want to be able to say, look, I have this uh, mistake, this uh, hard thing, whatever. But the paradox that brings up, but simultaneously sort of solves is that sometimes people will be honest. You'll get into like honest dialogue with people about like, here's what's going on with my life. But they're just like unloading toxic waste. you know. Mm-hmm. And it's like, uh, so you want to, you want to be able to be honest with people for the purpose of growth. And you want people to be honest with you for the purpose of growth and like higher values and accomplishing profound things and building a better life and a better world between you and all of that. Um, 
so yeah, it's, it's honesty for growth, not honesty for the wrong reasons and uh, not dishonesty for any reasons. So what do you think as we try to wrap it up for real? Bars. Bars. But I don't know. <laughs> um, any other closing thoughts? No, I think that's wonderful. I think it's a, I think it's a great, great place to end. Sure. Yeah. And yeah, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, anytime. And yeah, as, as I uh, got on this topic, I, I feel like it's a deep one and maybe we'll revisit it uh, maybe with us and maybe with other people uh, or maybe um, go at it from different angles. But it's it's a big one because it's it's basically your social environment, which is your whole uh, like like that like that's where we live it's not like just like we live in a house or we have uh you know these material things it's like our social environment is our our whole world that we live in it's it's like our um our soil that we grow the the good things in life that we need out of or you know that mm. we get we get sheep out of or dragons out of the cave or watch out for wolves mm. and scorpions you know and and we want that social environment to be one that causes us to become better and not worse but if but if we're not careful it can you know go the wrong way so um what do you think as we wrap it up for real <laughs> <laughs> he said for the second or third time <laughs> or fourth, I don't, I don't know, because yeah, we, yeah, we, yeah. ex no. we extended it. We were going to end it a few minutes earlier, but go ahead. We're okay. We're all right. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think that, I think it's all important to, to keep in mind and always just, if there's anything irritating you about your mm -hmm. life or your social life, just ask mm -hmm. yourself, what can I actually do about this? Mm -hmm. And what can I not do about this? Right. What do I have to accept and what do I have to change? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, especially these days when people's personas are falling off and people are on edge and irritable and everything else. And so we need um, some understanding, but also know when those lines are crossed and when that they, mm, yeah, when, when it goes too far. So, all right. But uh, yeah, any, any, um, anything on how people can find you or I'll just leave links to your podcast and all that stuff in the show notes. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I'm Jade Spansky. I'm at dear Jade on Instagram. My website is effortxless.com and I'm Jade Savansky on Facebook. You can just add me there. All right. Well, we appreciate it. All of your um, insights and uh, dragon taming behavior. <laughs> or slang sometimes and yeah. uh, keep it real jade stay archetypal and we'll see you around bye isaac thank you all right